The unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect truth is seldom met with, even in a hundred thousand myriad kalpas. Now we can see and hear it, we can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Reverend Master Mayon, for inviting me to offer some Dharma on this auspicious occasion of our Jizo ceremony, Krishnagarbha Bodhisattva. <clears throat> when I was thinking about um, a title for this, what came up for me was Nonviolence in the Bodhisattva Path. And then I thought, well, that's kind of redundant, isn't it? I mean, we all know that. The Bodhisattva Path can't be other than nonviolence, but I had never thought about the connection between the two. And it's been helpful for me to think about that this week. And I think part of it is, this is nothing new. In the midst of all the disasters that we have, um, poverty, racial inequality, injustice, climate change, and if that were not enough to challenge our practice, now we have a global health crisis. We have the novel COVID-19 virus. I looked um, yesterday to see what our figures are as far as cases and deaths. I don't do that all the time. I don't feel it's helpful, but it's helpful every once in a while to know what's going on, not only in Siskiyou County, where we are, but in California, where we live, and in the world. And what the New York Times reported was that in the US, we had 3.2 million cases and 134,000 deaths. And in the world, we had 12.5 million confirmed cases, and 561,424 deaths. So if anything will bring us to the reality of the moment, I think looking at the cases of illness and the deaths will do that. And there are certainly repercussions from this, unemployment, loss of housing, inadequate medical care, school and child care closures, and it goes on and on. And what it brought up for me was with all, the, with all of this, with all of the virus and the effects of the virus going on, then we also have the demonstrations and protest trying to call attention to the racial and economic inequality and injustices. And I was taken back to the early 60s and on into the 70s um, when I first learned and practiced nonviolence, um, which was very, which was the core, the real essence of the civil rights demonstrations, at least the ones that I participated in, later on the anti-Vietnam War demonstrations, and then after that in Seattle, where I lived, the anti-nuclear submarine demonstrations. And I was there on the front lines. And it may have been my first introduction to Buddhist teaching, at least the Buddhist teaching that we are all one. Because what came up for me was a very vivid memory of a demonstration in New York City where we were all lined up and the police were maybe eight feet in front of us. And I don't know what we were chanting. We were chanting something. And then, and then people started one at a time to call the policemen pigs. This was fairly common back then. And I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. And when I thought about why, I thought I looked at these 
guys. They were all men. They were mostly young. They were in uniform. And I thought, wait a minute. I have two brothers. They were in uniform when they were their age. One was in the National Guard. One was in the US Marine Corps. These men, these young guys standing in front of us are somebody's father, husband, brother, uncle. Why? I couldn't do that. And so I stayed with the demonstration, not having much choice. But I realized that there had to be a difference in my mind between what we were protesting, what we were demonstrating for and against, and the people that carried out those things. And so I continued, you know, uh, with the demonstrations and civil disobedience and all the things that you did then. And, and so when I realize now, how long has this been, 40, 50, 60 years later, um, that I've made the choice, a deliberate choice, not to be on the front lines. And so the question comes up then, how can I help? And since I'm not separate from you, how can we all help? And those of us that are unable to be on the front lines have a big responsibility, I think. Now, I realize that as a monk, living in a relatively sheltered, enclosed environment, that my daily life is probably quite different from yours in a number of ways. However, however, as aspirants on the Bodhisattva path, we share some remarkable similarities, such as meditating, mindfulness, keeping the precepts, trying to remember and understand the Four Noble Truths, the Six Paramitas, and actually walking the Eightfold Path. So in significant aspects of our life, we as monks and you as lay people are very close in thoughts and minds, if not in body. And more than ever, it confirms that we are all interconnected. We all want peace and harmony. And as the Dalai Lama often says, all beings want to be happy. We all want to be happy. We all want to be at peace, and we all want to be in harmony, whether we manifest that wish or not, whether we actually recognize that or not, but that's our innermost wish, regardless, I think, of whether we're Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, whatever. So the questions I'd like to explore this morning, I've come up with five. We may not get to all of them. What do we as Buddhists do in times of upheaval and distress, pain, grief, and sorrow. What is our reaction? What is our response? Secondly, where do we go for refuge during these times? And third, how do we direct our practice so as to follow the teachings of the Buddha? We weren't alive in the time of the Buddha. We weren't alive in the time of Christ. But from what I read, things were not peaceful and harmony. So looking and harmonious. So how do we follow in our tradition the teachings of the Buddha? And how do we not feel overwhelmed by the enormity of what is happening? And then lastly, how do we contribute towards peace and justice, racial and economic equality? I think that one of the ways that we do it is to recognize 
that we are all bodhisattvas. Reverend Tagon Daniel Layton, if I pronounce all of that right, makes a compelling case that we are all bodhisattvas. And in his book, Bodhisattva Archetypes, which was published way back in 1998, he carefully paints word pictures of all of our major bodhisattvas. And then he delineates those very qualities in, in contemporary and historic public, fixtures, fic, public figures. He points out Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, Mahatma Gandhi, Helen Keller, and many that I wouldn't have thought of. Pete Seeger, Jackie Robinson, Muhammad Ali, Roberto Clemente. It's a book well worth reading and rereading, and I think it's relevant for today. So I wanted to just read a few sentences of his descriptions of four major bodhisattvas in our tradition and, the, and what we can take from that into our own life in this time. And he says about Manjusri, who's the bodhisattva of wisdom and insight, with his, and this is from the book, with his relentless commitment, his being Manjusri, to uncovering ultimate reality, Manjusri embodies and represents the paramita of wisdom, prajna, the perfection of wisdom, both as a practice and as the body of sutras so named. Insight. This is what Manjusri personifies. Insight involves going within and seeing the fundamental. This energy, exemplified by Manjusri, is about pulling wisdom out of the depths of oneself. It's not outside ourself. We have to absorb the wisdom that's offered to us and then offer it back. It's about being an open channel for the awakening of Buddhahood to express itself. I found those sentences very illuminating. And of course, he has a whole chapter on Manjusri, which I'm not going to read. And then he talks about Samatha Bhadra functioning in the world. Samatha Bhadra, in his words, is the epitome of enlightening activity in the world. And, it, and he, she represents the shining function of wisdom. And I'll read you a little bit about what Reverend Layton says. Samatha Bhadra is the bodhisattva of enlightening activity in the world, representing the shining function of wisdom. Samatha Bhadra also embodies the luminous web of the interconnectedness of all beings. So if we want some illumination on what interconnectedness means, on what all is one and all is different means, we can obviously go to Rare Master Jiu's writings and we can also look at the life of Samatha Bhadra. So Reverend Layton then goes on to talk about Avalokiteshvara, which is probably, in our tradition, the most well-known bodhisattva. And what he says is this. Avalokiteshvara, the bodhisattva of compassion, is the most popular of all bodhisattvas. Avalokiteshvara assumes so many different forms, has so many different closely associated figures and takes on such varied coloration in new cultures that we might understand this complex bodhisattva as a whole assemblage 
of archetypes of spiritual life. And he then goes on in another chapter to talk about Kishnagarbha, Jizo, the bodhisattva whose merits we celebrated in our festival this morning, and says, in modern Japan, Jizo, Kishnagarbha, is still highly venerated as a protector of children and travelers and as a guide to the afterlife. Jizo is especially prominent as a protector of the spirits of aborted fetuses and deceased children. Traditionally, Jizo is guardian of and guide to the underworld and afterlife, and he especially benefits those in the hell realms. As friend to those in hell, Jizo loyally stands by and comforts the tortured, the wretched, and the inflicted, afflicted. So I find this all both illuminating and inspiring. And so with that as a background, I would look at the questions I posed earlier. What do we as Buddhists do in times of upheaval and distress? Well, I think the first one, for me as an obvious one, is to sit still. We can offer merit for everyone that's afflicted by the virus, for everyone that's helping, for everyone who's lost their home, their job, etc. And we can ask for help in the way that we look at the world. Because what we want to do is look both outward and inward with a nonviolent mind. We want to not judge. That's difficult. We want to not criticize. That may be easy for you. It's not easy for me. And we want to understand that everyone is doing the best we can. And that's not a Pollyanna attitude. That's something that Reverend Master Jiu said early in my monastic life. She probably said it before that, that everyone is doing the best they can. And if they could do better, if they knew how to do better, they would. So where do we go for refuge? Nowhere. Because our refuge is right here. It's inside ourself. It's all we've learned about Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. That doesn't mean we can't learn more. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask our seniors for help. But we have to realize that our refuge is within ourselves. We have to look to our practice. We have to look to our meditation. We have to look to our Buddhist teachings. So then comes up the question, how do we direct our practice to follow these teachings? Well, I think there are a number of things that we can do. We can add a little bit more meditation to our daily practice. We can ask ourselves, well, exactly what is the problem? What is the problem that I see and what needs to be done and how can I help? And most of us, I think, sort of look outside. The, you know, the world, it's a global problem. There's so many people involved. And then we kind of sink from how can I help to there's nothing I can do. And I'm always encouraged when that comes up by the story that many seniors have told me that Reverend Master Jiu, I believe this was when she was establishing Throssel, was faced with a really massive cleanup task. And there were only, I understand, a few monks there. She grabbed a broom and said, you start wherever you are. And that has always encouraged me because before I start trying to solve the problems of the world, 
I want to be able to solve the problems with Scholastica, the problems with my state of mind, the problems with how I act towards other monks, the problem of when I watch the news on my little laptop or when I hear the news, am I critical of people? Do I get angry and judgmental? Or can I offer merit for what's going on? If nonviolence is such a help to me, and if I say it's an important part of my thinking, then I really need to practice it, don't I? I really need to be able to look at myself. We can't very well do anything else than start where we are. We are here, and this moment is all we have. And the answer of what to do is often right in front of us. So thinking back, if you recall, the fourth question was how do we not feel overwhelmed by the enormity of what is happening all around us? And, and, and I hope it's obvious these questions are not separate questions. They interweave with each other. The questions and the answers are not separate from each other. I think one of the things that helps me to not feel overwhelmed is to focus on the good that's being done in the world. And also, gratitude for what we have and what we can do. In in the book Inside the Grass Hut, Ben Connolly quotes from the poem, turn around the light to shine within, then just return. So what we do is take our wisdom and compassion, use it to look at what we're doing and what's inside ourselves, and then open our hands and hearts and let that light shine outside. I think it was um, Shinra Suzuki was quoted in one of his books to say, it is enough to shine one corner. We don't have to light up the world. We just have to shine the corner, let our light shine in front of us. So then, how do we contribute? How do we use our practice to contribute towards peace and justice, towards racial and economic equality? Well, as I've already said, I think we practice nonviolence in our thoughts, in our speech, and in our actions. And now, it's a perfect opportunity to turn our awareness within, whether we live in a monastery or whether we live in the world, whether we're isolated in our homes or whether we're actually out working. This is a perfect opportunity to look within, to listen to our thoughts and actions, and ask ourselves, what am I saying? What am I thinking? What am I doing? What am I not doing that would be good to do? I think we do the simple things that express our willingness to let go of self and embrace all beings. Let go of self and embrace all beings. Be willing to do the possible. And we don't need to be in the ideal situation before we act. For a number of years, I've had the responsibility and, and really the honor of um, corresponding with a number of prison inmates as the Abbey's prison outreach chaplain, I guess. Or Master Dyson did it before me, and I've, again, been fortunate enough to do it these past years. And I correspond with about 14 inmates. Um, most of them are in for fairly long periods of time, 20 and 30 years. 
I correspond with one that was sentenced when he was 19, and he'll be 40 soon. Um, the people I correspond with, most of them are men, only one is a woman, have been a source of inspiration for me in my practice, as well as a source of grief and sorrow for what they're going through. But without fail, each and every one of them, when they write to me over the past three months, have said, I hope you and all the monks are well. I hope everyone is doing OK there at the Abbey. And they ask about us. And they say some really inspiring and wonderful things. Now, most of the ones I correspond with and the prisons I read about, most of them are on a pretty severe lockdown, 23 out of 24 hours. They might be confined to their, their cells. They don't have their weekly services anymore. They're not able to get together as a sangha. A lot of them have a Buddhist sangha. And there isn't time to read you all the comments, but I thought I would read you one letter that I got recently. The handwriting's not all that legible, so forgive me if I stumble a little bit. I have found that the, in talking about the restrictions, I have found that the best thing I can do is try to be a source of kindness, generosity, and a non judgmental listener as often as possible for those around me. Setting an example of how to treat people can make a difference in others' lives while they are here and subject to so much oppression and abuse. It is really the best I can do to be a source of peace and consistent expression of humanity here, which is lacking all too often. And he goes on. And I thought, wow, wow. And I get these letters frequently, you know, once a week, several a month, etc. And so I'm always inspired to think that in what is certainly less than an ideal situation, that these people that I correspond with, incarcerated for years and years and years, some are life without parole, some have a few more months to go, some have years to go, at least one is on death row, and yet, and yet, they are walking the bodhisattva path. The um, prisoner who's on death row and whose execution is scheduled very soon spends a lot of his time helping other prisoners to file their legal petitions. He's been there long enough that he's got a lot of experience with it. So we can practice wherever we are. We don't have to be in an ideal situation. We recently offered a seven-day, I think, uh, retreat online. And Reverend Chico did um, talks on the faces of compassion. And I was so kind of surprised, given the difficult times that we're in, by the donations that we got for, as a result of that retreat and the letters that people wrote to us along with their donation. And I'll read you just one paragraph. Dear monks, to all of you for your gift of the past retreat, thank you so much for all it has brought, you in our homes, and now our homes are sacred places where we have deepened our meditations to look more closely at places to train. 
it was always a challenge for me to be at the Abbey and then to transfer that experience home. But now the Abbey is in my home. So regardless of where we are, regardless of what our circumstances are, we can train, we can walk the path of the Bodhisattva. So in closing, in closing, I would offer to you four reminders that I've come up with to help me remember my vow to walk the Bodhisattva path. And here are the four, and then I'll talk a little bit, very little bit about each one. Look up, let go, sit still, and walk on. I think looking up for me means being alert for examples of inspiration and courage. And they're all around us, regardless of how, mm, what do I want to say, uh, despairing the news might be. If you look, you can always find examples of people that are setting up food pantries. There was one that I liked a lot which uh, this one person was writing poems, and then the poems would go with the meals that went to seniors in their apartment. So they'd get a meal, and they'd also get a poem. Um, you know, there are all kinds of things that we can do, that other people do, that we can do. Let go of our expectations of how things should be or how we should be. Sit still, take a deep breath, that's always a good one. Pause, another good one, and ask ourselves, what is our intention? You know, if you've read anything at all, probably, on Buddhism, intention is what drives karma. And our intention to practice the Buddha's teaching, to meditate, to keep the precepts, this is what cleans up our karma. And I'm not going to get into it, but when we cleanse our karma, we are helping other people's karma because we are not spreading the virus of our karma around. That's the way I think about it. And walk on. Look up. Let go, sit still, and walk on. It's our responsibility to move forward. I'm reminded of another thing that I used to hear Ribbon Master G often say. I was her nurse chaplain for a number of years. I was a very, very young novice. I didn't make the distinction between being a young novice and being a senior experienced RN, but I learned that while I was with her. And so she would ask me for advice on something medical that she was being asked to do. And I would go on and on and on and give her all the advice I knew, which was much more than she'd want. And she'd, and she'd say, okay, Laz, thank you. And then I would just kind of sit there and she would look at me and say, well, Get on with it, Lass. Get on with it. And I often think about that because I think so often we get so involved in trying to sort out what is it we should do? What's my intention? What's good to do here? I don't want to make a mistake. Fine. Put your hands in gasho. Look up and get on with it. So. One of the questions that I quite frequently ask myself when I find myself dithering back and forth is, if not now, when? And if not here, where? We are all bodhisattvas. And there's no better time than now to be the change we want to see in the world. What's needed now? compassion, and wisdom. So when we practice the Bodhisattva ways, we hear 
the cries of the world. We can listen, we can pay attention, and we can get the self out of the way. That would be, if before I die, I'm able to do that, I would feel that that would be a major contribution to the peace and harmony of the world. So recognizing that all is one and all is different. May we all be well and stay safe. Thank you. Homage to the Buddha. Homage to the Dharma. Homage to the Sangha.